Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of the Free Marketeers. My name is Chris, and today I'm joined by two very special guests from the US, uh, two people I've been very excited to talk to for quite a while now, ever, start, ever since I started reading and finished reading their latest work. So I'm very glad that I get to have them on today. Uh, in this episode, we are joined by Professor Christopher Coyne. He is Professor of Economics at George Mason University and the Associate Director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics and Economics at the Mercatus Center. And then we're also joined by Professor Peter Butke. He is University Professor of Economics and Philosophy at George Mason University, the bb and Professor for the Study of Capitalism and the Director of the F.A. Hayek Program for the Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Professors, thank you very much for being here. And thank you for having us, Chris. So the main focus of today's episode is uh, a work that you both um, put together um, that came out, I think it was end of last year. Um, I might be wrong on my date, so please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. But um, this was released by the Fraser Institute entitled Essential Austrian Economics. So I wanted to ask you a sort of a starting point, maybe to you first, uh, Peter, just why did you undertake this project? What was sort of the, the sort of starting point? I guess you could just say, you could give me a one word answer and say Austrian economics, but what sort of started this for you? For you? Well, I, uh, I think that anytime I get a chance to work with a project with Chris, I wanna jump at it. Uh, we've had a great uh, sort of partnership. And I think it's important to understand that we're both educators and we put a high premium on educating and basic economic education is a critical idea as well as advanced graduate program education. So most of our efforts, Chris and mine, are directed at graduate students and PhD students and fellow peers in scientific economics. And so, for example, a couple of years ago, we did this book for Oxford, which is the Oxford Handbook on Austrian Economics, which is more sort of advanced refinements, surveys, sub summaries of ongoing developments to Austrian economics. And so we were approached by uh, Fraser with this opportunity to boil it all down to very essentials that would be useful to a college freshman or an interested layperson or whatever, what were the essential elements of Austrian economics. And you know, this is actually a very uh, important challenge to people like Chris and I, because we're used to talking at so far removed to students and, and fall easily into jargon and other kinds of things like that. And we wanted to try to strip that away and get to the essence of the ideas so that people could see the power of economic reasoning for understanding the world out their window. And hopefully that's what we tried to do here without doing you know, uh, a disservice to the more sophisticated presentations that one finds in these original scholars, right? But we're trying to reach the, 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 the basic ideas uh, to uh, people. And, and, and I think that, uh, you know, every time I get a chance to work with Chris on economic communication, it's really valuable. So Chris, to you then I'll ask, so I guess not, not that we'd want to, to put it in these terms, but sort of a, a handbook to Austrian economics for the sort of common man as it were. Yeah, I, I think I would, I would, I would kind of couch it as a, a entry point okay. uh, into Austrian economics for, for the interested, as Pete put it, either layperson or or student. Um, certainly, especially earlier in their ed economic education, uh, and so you know, as Pete mentioned, the, the way we kind of think about this is as is, is being part of a portfolio of activities that that he and I. Uh, have been involved in individually. Pete's been working in this area of, of Austrian economics broadly for, for decades, uh, well before uh, I was uh, a student. In fact, I was an undergraduate student of Pete's. That's how I got into Austrian economics in the first place. So he introduced me to it. But since uh, uh, the early 2000s, this is just the latest kind of iteration of, of our work together in Austrian economics. And uh, as he mentioned, a lot of it's focused on uh, the scholarly community, the graduate student community, and then you can see this as, as reaching a different audience with those ideas. And so one of the things we did in the, in the monograph, which I, I really like, is at the end of it, we have a, a list of further readings and we broke it down by other kind of introductory works, intermediate works and advanced works. And so the interested reader can kind of pick and choose what they wanna do based on their background and what their, their interests are. 
If I could add one other thing too, real quick, is that I think that the entire essential series that Fraser has put out is in this same vein and it's extremely valuable. I mean, you know, the one on Hayek, which our colleague Don Boudreau did, is a fantastic introduction, uh, you know, to, to, Don, to Hayek's ideas. But more recent ones about Robert Nozick or Joseph Schumpeter or Milton Friedman, uh, these are just really fantastic. And I think that this exercise of making these ideas, which are often very abstract and remote, more concrete to people is a real uh, valuable gift. And, and uh, you know, I was mentioning to you, Chris, right before we started this about Chris Coyne and I losing our colleague, you know, Walter Williams, and the power that Walter Williams had as a thinker was precisely in this genre, the ability to take very sophisticated economic reasoning, but make it have very common sense impact on everyday people. And so we value that. And we hope that we tried to do that, even with regard to like dealing with Austrian economics, which is a subset of the economic way of thinking. Yeah. So touching on some of those names you've already mentioned, and Chris, I'll go to you here for, to start with this one. So just for the viewers and, and the listeners, if you could sort of touch on for you, the, the sort of central or main figures in in Austrian economics, I know that's an unfair question because there's so many to list, but if you could sort of touch on two or three and, and maybe, yeah, um, sort of highlights that you take from them. Sure. So, you know, as you mentioned, that's a, a big question, but, but perhaps one way to think about it, to kind of distill it down is to think about it in terms of categories or, or generations of scholars. And so I, I think one would have to start with Karl Menger. Uh, who is the, considered the founder of the Austrian school. Uh, Menger published a book in 1871 called Principles of Economics. And Menger was part of what is called, in terms of, of the history of thought, uh, the marginal revolution in economics. He was one of three co-revolutionaries. And what the marginal revolution was in a, a very simplistic form was a paradigm shift in economics away from the labor theory of value, the idea that that value is a function of the amount of effort or labor that is involved in producing the good or service to marginalism, to, to thinking on the margin. Uh, so, so marginalism is the idea that we're focused not on kind of either or thinking. Our choices that we engage in are not either or one or zero. They are marginal. I don't choose between having just water or no water. It's a marginal unit of water, and, and that's the, the margin of choice. And that revolutionized the economic way of thinking. Menger also made several other key contributions. He developed a theory of the emergence of prices. He uh, crystallized an economic theory of exchange, which is at the foundation of prices. He talked about the role of spontaneous order, emergent institutions, and the role that they played in a whole host of areas. He focused on, on money, but there's many other areas. In any case, that, that had a, a foundational impact on the economics discipline. That's kind of generation one, if you will. Generation two then, uh, which I, I'll only spend a moment on, is two thinkers who, who were directly influenced by, by Menger, uh, Jürgen von Bavrik and, and Frederick von Wieser. Uh, they did a, a range of important work in, in academics. Uh, von Bavrik was important in not just the development of the theory of capital, but also in engaging Karl Marx and pointing out some of the fundamental flaws in, in Marx's system as it pertained to exploitation labor, the iron law of wages, and so on, and some of the fundamental flaws. But the other thing I just want to highlight with these individuals, because I think it's important, is both of them held quite prestigious academic positions, but also were involved in public policy. Uh, and that is a, a theme that is present, I think, throughout much of the, the history of Austrian economics is this uh, involvement uh, in scholarly, the scholarly world, having a foot in that world, but also relevance to policy as well. In any case, you fast forward to the next generation, and those uh, folks include Ludwig von Mises uh, and F.A. Hayek, um, who, who Hayek is probably the most well-known Austrian. Um, and then from there, 
uh, you know, Hayek and Mises, of course, engaged in, in numerous debates, uh, the calculation debate about socialism, which we can talk about more if, it, if it's of interest, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Hayek, of course, had a uh, debate with Keynes about macroeconomics and uh, the various causes and consequences of uh, expansive monetary policy and the stability of capitalism as a system. Um, uh, from Mises and Hayek, then you move into folks like uh, Israel Kirzner, you move into folks like Ludwig Lachman and Murray Rothbard, who was the next generation. Um, and then, of course, they made major contributions to uh, theory of entrepreneurship, theory of the market process and how markets operate, uh, and, and price theory in general, uh, developing kind of the corpus of, of economic theory that their, their predecessors uh, Mises, Hayek, but going all the way back to Menger had uh, generated and, and produced. And so those are kind of the main characters. Um, if I had to highlight a few, um, I'll, I'll stop there. We can talk about, uh, you know, Pete might have some more to add to that, but we also can, can talk in, about details related to any of them as you, as you uh, see fit. Yeah, Pete, anything for you to add on that list of celebrities, I guess? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that one of the the big issues that Chris mentions is the idea of the, the foot in two camps in the belief that you are engaged in a science, but also that science is a public science, which also engages in, in that relevance is a virtue rather than a vice. Um, but the difference was, and this is captured in a wonderful scholarly book uh, called The Viennese Students of Civilization by Erwin Decker, who teaches at Erasmus University. And this is published by Cambridge University Press, is that the Austrians uh, were of, uh, from the beginning, were part of a cultural understanding that they weren't interveners in a process. Um, they were, in fact, ones who tried to cultivate a process. So you, what you're worried about is the ecology within which decisions were being made rather than particular policy decisions that you were gonna change, if that makes any sense. And, and you can see this play out from Menger all the way up to today uh, in terms of this kind of, so the focus to the Austrians is on the general rules of the game rather than any particular intervention about plays within the game. And so this gets confused a lot of times because the Austrians believe relevance is a virtue, but they're not social planners. And it's not just because of an ideological issue. It's, it has to do with a basic vision about the role that the scientist plays in society, but then also the analytical notions, which we'll talk about, about means and ends and what the appropriate role is for the scientist when they're trying to be relevant to society. So uh, the second volume of Keynes's biography by Skidelsky, which is brilliant, calls Keynes the economist as savior, okay? And Keynes did view his project as that of being a savior. The, the Austrians would see the economist as a student, never as a savior. And in fact, they, they, they would reject the idea that the economist is a savior. But there, that, that difference in their window through which they see the world is going to play out in all of these uh, different areas. The one last thing I want to say, because we don't talk enough about it in the book, because remember, we're, we're bringing it down to the basics, and we choose to focus on this. But Rothbard, um, if you look at one of the things that Rothbard's most important contribution is, it's probably in his theory of interventionism. Um, so there's other kind, Rothbard made many other contributions, but his theory of interventionism is really quite a uh, significant advance over earlier presentations of the interventionism in the market. And so I, I you know, and if you look at Lachman, it's about capital theory, right? And the capital using economy. And you look at Kersner, it's about the entrepreneur. So each of them took from Mises and Hayek their basic framework, and then develop parts of it in their own unique direction. And then Chris and my generation, we're trying to work with those ideas and apply them to the world today. And so that you see a lot of our emphasis has been in applied economics, 
applying these ideas to issues in development economics and transition economics and in de uh, defense and peace economics, sort of these kind of issues. And so I think that uh, that makes sense because the theory is getting honed and honed and honed and it gets tested against the application. And so you see that, yeah. I can't think of many examples of where you might apply the theory, because as we all know, we have uh, free market economies all around the world. So I struggle <laughs> where you might uh, apply these, but we'll get into the real world examples a bit later. The next question I had was, I mean, this can also be tied to the figures, I suppose, but I wanted to ask you about the, the sort of central pillars or principles of Austrian economics, if indeed that is the right way to think about it. You know, if I have to write a spark note summary about Austrian economics, can I say three things sort of thing? Uh, I'll go to you first, Chris. So I think the, the key element to highlight is purposive human action. I think that's really the, the essence of economics for those working in the Austrian tradition. I think it captures a lot of other salient features. And, and so let me just spend a moment unpacking that. And so purposeful in, in the in the purpose of human actions means goal oriented. People don't act randomly. They, they act to achieve some goal. Now, what is that goal, that end? Well, whatever it is they want to accomplish. Uh, uh, the, the economist proper takes those ends as given and doesn't pass judgment on them, doesn't talk about them being good or bad. They, they are what they are. There, there are other fields that talk about good or bad ends. A ethicists talks about, talk about what it means to, to live a good or, or a bad life and so on. But economics proper can't speak to that. So that's the purposeful point. People, people act with a goal, with an intention. Human is also important here because it highlights that our purpose of the social sciences, our purpose of economics is to understand the behavior of human beings. It is a social science, but real, more importantly, and perhaps more accurately, it's a human science. This is important for a host of reasons, one of them being that it's going to influence the methods we adopt to carry out our analysis as economists. And this insight really underpins many of the critiques by Mises by Hayek and, and others about attempts by social scientists to mimic the methods in the natural sciences. The, the main idea being that, that the human sciences are different from the natural sciences. Why? Because we're talking about human beings who are purposefully acting. When, when a, a chemist is carrying out an experiment with atoms, uh, they don't have to worry about the atom choosing, about engaging in choice. They don't have, a, the, the atom does not have a plan, does not have a goal. And that has fundamental and important implications for the way you do science. So purposive human action, that's, and what flows directly out of that? Methodological individualism. Because in order to have human action, you need a human. Well, what's a human? It's a person. And, and if you appreciate the fact that people act purposefully, you also should appreciate that people are going to pursue different goals. My goals might be different than yours, which might be different than Pete's and so on down the line. And so we wanna focus on individual proposals of human action. Then also that what flows out of that, and it's the third thing I'll highlight, since you asked for three, is subjectivism. The idea that because we are focused on human actors, the facts of the social sciences, as Hayek put it, is what people think and believe how they perceive the world, what goals they perceive, but also how they perceive the means to achieve those goals. And so this emphasis on subjectivism is something that made Menger quite unique back in the 1870s, but also more broadly building off that makes Austrian economics more unique as a, a tradition and field of, uh, of, of inquiry. And so I'll stop there. There's much more to be said about each of those things. Um, but but perhaps Pete has more to add um, to, to what I just said. Well, I think that what Chris just said is perfect. One of the things I really like about this little monograph that we did was the centrality of economic calculation that comes out of it. And, and I want to try to make a stab at how that follows from what Chris was just talking about. And I think one of the most fundamental rule like laws of economics is that we live in a world of scarcity. It's very important to understand scarcity is not material abundance or 
lack of material abundance, not poverty. Scarcity has to do with a logical condition that you can't do two things at once, right? And so as a result of the fact that we live in a world of scarcity, we have to make trade-offs. That is, we choose to do A rather B because we can't do A and B at the same time. So we're always making trade-offs at all times um, in, our, in our decisions. And in order to make those trade-offs in a rational way, we're going to have to negotiate those trade-offs. You know, we don't live in corner solutions. We just always do A or we just always do B. We're always weighing these different trade-offs. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And it changes. And all the principles of subjectivism, which is the expectations and values that I place on those trade-offs, and marginalism, which is that you know, it depends. I don't make all the choices all at one time. I make them always on the margin. Well, in order for me to negotiate these trade-offs that I engage in, I need to have certain institutions. And those institutions that have evolved are property, which incentivizes us, prices, which inform us, and profit and loss statements, which both lure us and discipline us. So it's very important to emphasize profit, luring, losses, disciplining our decisions. And based on the interaction between property prices and profit and loss, we adjust and adapt our decisions in weighing all these trade-offs. That process of doing that is economic calculation. And some institutional environments are conducive to rational economic calculation and other institutional environments are in fact uh, hindering of economic calculation or distorting of economic calculation. So again, the if you put economic calculation at the center, which we do, it follows right after the methodological pre, uh, presentations in our, in, our, in our monograph, and you think about all that's entailed in that simple act of, of negotiating these trade-offs that people engage in, then you can see that our study of economic systems is not, oh, I value this system and you don't value it. It's not just about vanilla and chocolate ice cream or some moral judgment. It's actually just about negotiating trade-offs and we need to negotiate trade-offs doesn't matter you know the most socialist person in the world needs to negotiate trade-offs the most you know anarcho-capitalist person in the world needs to negotiate trade-offs so we all need to negotiate trade-offs the question is what institutions enable the, the ability to negotiate trade-offs and what ones hinder it and that's what we as economists and political economists study and so I think by putting that forward in the monograph is very similar to Mises. Um, and, uh, and let me just want make one other back reference for your listeners. Chris mentioned that we give all of the, the different readings and we mentioned these different names. And I think that's right. All of these names are very, very important people in the history of the, of the evolution of the economic science. But if you ask me who like embodies Austrian economics, you know, the single person that embodies the research program and what it's all about, I would say it's Mises. So the way I would put the relationship between Mises and Hayek is that Mises is the greatest economist within the history of the Austrian school and Hayek is his greatest student, right? So Hayek is an elaborator on the Misesian system. Now that sounds weird to a lot of people who see them as juxtaposed to each other because they had different temperaments they had a lot of different sort of nuanced positions and there are important differences between them. But I think if you see them more as a joint research project in juxtaposition to say Keynes and uh, the British uh, hegemonic position of Keynesianism, let's say James Mead and other people, or in America, Paul Samuelson and, you know, James Tobin and, and those people all the way up to today you know, with Stiglitz and Krugman or Jeff Sachs. The Mises Hayek program is what we're trying to distill and communicate it, or, or interested lay people get excited about that program. But it, it, it fundamentally is, I think the essence of it in application to interventionism to business cycles, to the problem of socialism is all about this issue of understanding the role that economic calculation plays in how a economic system can organize itself.
So there were about 10 points there that I wanted to continue talking on about, but two I want to highlight and I'd like you to elaborate on a bit more. There's one, the subjective theory of value and just how, because for a lot of people, you know, with science, especially there are objective facts about the world. So when people hear subjective theory of value, they might say, well, are you saying there are no facts? Is reality not what it is? How do I perceive it? That might for some people engender a bit of an existential question or at least an epistemological question and discussion. And then secondly, just on the importance of property rights, of course, in South Africa, um, the parliament is looking at amending section 25 of our constitution to do away with or to implement and allow for expropriation of property without compensation. So just the importance of property rights for, I guess, a, a prosperous or hopefully prosperous society. So if you can start off on just the subjective theory of value part to either one of you. So maybe maybe I'll, I'll start with subjective value. Pete can add to that and then he can take the property rights one. And so you raise a good point, but, but here's one way to put it. The subjective theory of value is an objective theory. And so it is a, a theory that is applicable across time and space. Right. And so it's not that facts don't matter. It's not that, you know, uh, uh, A is an A. That's not, that's not the, the, the point being made. The point is this. We all perceive the world in different ways and how we perceive things and value them differs. You know, the, the kind of popular saying, one person's trash is a per another person's treasure is really getting at the essence of this. And if you think about it, everyone understands this point, even if they don't understand subjectivism or the, the, the nuances of opportunity cost that Pete was laying out, which is this, think about any exchange. Any exchange, as Manger pointed out, requires reversed valuations of the goods or services being exchanged. That is, I have to value what you have more than you do and vice versa, or no exchange takes place. If, there, if a good or service had an objective value, something was valued at three, however you measure it, and something else was measured at four, and that was objective, meaning it was the value held by all, there'd be no exchange because no one would ever exchange something that was worth less for something worth more. So that's the idea of that. Now it's even more nuanced, which is that when people are ranking the goals that they seek to achieve, going back to our discussion of, of means and ends, and when they then are ranking the value of the various means that go into them, the subjectivist just says people value things differently. You know, I, I, I value coffee very highly. Someone else might value tea very highly. Uh, and that's all fine and good. There's nothing, you know, again, from a standpoint of, of, of economics proper, we don't pass judgment on whether it's good or bad to drink coffee versus T. Now, why does this matter? Well, it matters for several reasons, and I'll highlight two briefly. One kind of historical, it still matters today, but then one more relevant to today. And then I'll, I'll turn it over to Pete. Historical, what Menger and his followers were engaging with is what was known as, as I mentioned earlier, labor theory value, or, or the, the view that the cost of production determined the theory of value, the cost production theory of value. What was that? that the value of a good or service is determined by the cost of the inputs that go into producing it. Really what Menger and those in that tradition did was flip that over. And they said that, no, it is not, you know, you purchase the inputs, whatever those might be, and you add up the value and that's the value of the, the output. But really it is what the consumer, the ordinary consumer, the value they place on the final output, the consumer good, is what determines the value of all the things that are, used to produce that output. In other words, a transistor in your computer doesn't have any value because it costs a lot of money to, to, to get it. It is because consumers value the final in output that that input is used to produce. And so you can see again how this relates to Pete's earlier point. Along every step of that production process, someone has to make judgments about trade-offs. And how are you gonna get that feedback? So that's where subjective value comes in, in terms of the, the, the historical point, which again, still matters today, of course, but at the time, the, the cost theory of production dominated. And, and again, Menger really flipped that right over and his followers flipped that over where it was the final output that determined the value of the inputs, the, the idea of derived demand, the, the, the value of the inputs derived their value from their, their contribution to the final output. How does this matter today? Well, it matters today, and this goes back to Pete's point earlier about the economist as a student versus savior. If you think you are a savior, it means 
implicitly, if not explicitly, you can step outside of the system, analyze the system, and make moves to improve the welfare of people. So I can add up, I can look at Chris's behavior, I can look at Pete's behavior, I can look at other people's behavior, I can say either they're acting irrationally, or alternatively, I can make moves that will improve their welfare. One question that comes out of that, there's many, one question that comes out of that is how do you know what Chris wants? How do you know what Pete wants? How do you know what everyone else wants? How do you get inside their mind? And then how do you aggregate that up into some kind of social welfare function that you can operate on to improve society? This is bound up in the broader issue of the, the proper limits of economics and the proper role of the economic scientist. Notice that that is different from saying, I want to understand how prices emerge. I don't wanna pass judgment on prices. I don't wanna pass judgment on people's behavior, but I want to understand that phenomena and all the complexities and nuances that led to that phenomena. And that's where an appreciation of subjectivism leads you. And so uh, I'll stop there, but I think that's really at the kind of heart of, and essence of, of what subjectivism it really entails. So uh, before, Pete, just it, before you jump in, um, yeah. just especially on the property rights, Chris, I just wanted to, so one example that jumps into my mind and correct me if I'm wrong on the example, but the whole issue the last year around the pandemic and shortages of toilet paper and then the, the reasoning behind imposing um, price controls, that kind of thing. So am I sort of, what, what you've tried, what, what you've explained there, would that be sort of the seed of the view that a committee or a board or a politician needs to impose price controls because they know what people are going to need a long-term kind of thing. They need to make sure that people behave correctly, as it were. I think it is the broader, I think it's a, a, an example of a broader phenomena, which is that interventionism is the idea, if you step back and say, what is interventionism? It is the view that a small group of elites can use the discretionary power that is granted to government to intervene upon a system to achieve their, their, the ends that they want to achieve. That's what it is. In this case, it's, it's, it's getting toilet paper to the right people or having more of it, whatever the claim was at the time. There was, there was many claims being made. And so, yes, that is, is one example. And then, of course, as Pete was saying, what Austrian scholars call dynamics of interventionism is, is then tracing out the chain of consequences of that intervention into the system. And there's both direct interventions we see queuing as people line up then to get toilet paper because they can't rely on other mechanisms to, to achieve it. But then there's these long chain of consequences that go back all the way through the structure of production as government starts to distort the various signals uh, that are being sent through people's uh, activities. So if I, 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 I have two strands and I just want to go over briefly. So again, remember that in this monograph, we're doing the essentials. So we can't get into any kind of deep, sophisticated discussion of methodology, but we give readers pointers in the end. But ultimately, to go back to your original question, Chris, you know, these are questions of the difference between ontology and epistemology. And what the Austrians are arguing, going back to what Chris stressed before, that economics is a human science. And let me emphasize that human science, um, that that claim is that economics is on the same ontological status as physics, but has different epistemological procedures to be able to get to its laws and its principles. And this was very important for Menger to stress and Bambavrik and then eventually Mises to push forward because the late 19th century development of classical economics followed a very basic intuition that we all have, which is that in our explanations of the natural world, when we relied on human purposes and plans to explain it, we engage in the sin of anthropomorphism. Right. So, you know, the change of the seasons is because, you know, Hades and Persephone or whatever, you know, have this thing going on and one, you know, for the winter and then for the summer or Zeus is pissed off. And so he throws lightning down at us or something like that. And we, of course, advanced in the natural sciences when we got rid of anthropomorphism. So shouldn't the human sciences also get rid of anthropomorphism? And that's embodied in Ricardo. 
Ricardo wanted us to get rid of the human purposes and plans and try to explain economic phenomena by the long run costs you know, that are associated, the objective issues are right. So the Austrians are fighting back against that and emphasizing the importance of the human. Now, a, a South African economist named Carl Mittenmeyer uh, has a wonderful essay on what he calls mechanomorphism, which is the disease economists suffer from, which is that if we economists who are human purposes and plans should be the center, if we purge the human from the science, we end up not committing anthropomorphism, but mechanomorphism. We attribute natural explanations to things that are really human. And so we should be very, and so, you know, we're trying to, to, to build on that to make sure. And if you think about that, that fo you know, folds right into the kind of emphasis that Chris was just talking about with regard to subjectivism of expectations, subjectivism of value, subjectivism of cost. So this is what's going on in the individual. Now, where does this individual engage in these assessments of their future possibilities? Well, they take those assessments within a set of rules. Those rules create the framework within which decisions are made. One of the most important of those rules, going all the way back to recognizing what Hume said, which is property, contract, and consent, right? So we have to have these institutional framework which recognizes property, contract and consent, right? The, the idea of the, of, uh, of the recognizing of possession, the ability to transfer that possession to others through consent, all right? And the keeping of promises. If I say to you, I'm gonna you know, promise to be here to give a talk at the F, uh, you know, Free Market Foundation podcast, and then I don't show up, there's, you know, that's, that would be screwy. So what is it that we think about property rights? When we think about property rights, as providing predictability in the environment of which people can then engage in. And it forms their expectations. So let me just give you two quick examples from the world, all right? Uh, one of them is in New York City. So I started my teaching career basically in New York City. And at the time I was still a pretty active person. I don't look as active now as I did then. But I used to play basketball every day at noon, and I, I was still playing tennis a lot. And I had this really nice pair of Nikes that I just got after I was playing basketball. I went to take a shower in the NYU locker room, and I left my shoes just sitting there. I came back. They were brand new, by the way. And I came back, and they were gone. And I was like, ah, you know, like, you know, freaking out about it. So I head my way to the train later on that afternoon and I'm going up, you know, along uh, 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 Fifth Avenue there. And there's a guy who has a table with a blanket that's crossed across the table. And he's got all kinds of wares, including my shoes. OK, and and on my shoes, by the way, I used to put my initials PJB. So I say to the guy, hey, you got my shoes. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, those are my shoes. And he says, no, they're my shoes. I just, you know, I got them. And I said, well, how much for them? And he looks at me and he says, $40. And I'm like, dude, I, they're my shoes. He says, how can you prove to me they're my shoes? I said, look at my initials. He goes, that doesn't mean anything. So I gave the guy 40 bucks to get my shoes back, which were 80 bucks that I bought like two days earlier. Anyway, the point is, is that notice what this guy's store was. His store was a blanket. And if the cops came by, he could scoop up the blanket and bolt before the cops could start to bug him. That is because there, he lacked security in the property rights because it was stolen goods that he was fencing, you know, basically. Now go to post-communist Russia in 19, after 1992. Rather than fenced goods, what you had in that situation was constant monitoring by the regulators. And so one of the things that was most shocking, I started my career, besides being in New York, also studying post-communism and things like that. One of the things that was most shocking is kiosk economy. When uh, communist countries, Prague or the, Moscow, these are the places that I visit the most of the time. When they first opened up, they had tremendous street fairs, street trading all over the place, right? It came out. But what they didn't have was investment in physical plants. Why didn't they invest in physical plants? It was precisely because they didn't have security of property rights. Therefore, their expectations were is that their investment wouldn't be protected 
Therefore, their investment time horizon was very short. So they could sell goods and services, which is tremendous improvement over the black market view. They could now sell them out in the open rather than underneath a bridge or somewhere, right? But they could sell them now in the open. But what they weren't doing was investing in physical plant until they started to get more security in their property rights. So one of the questions I think that citizens of South Africa have to ask is, what happens when we run that process in reverse? When we start with a world where we have secure and enforced property rights, but now we start to uh, you know, make them less secure and, and certainly not enforceable, what's gonna happen to the investment opportunities that people will have? Because, it, and again, it, you, can, you can have for normative reasons, different assessments. Like you say, oh, you know, uh, in order to, uh, to uh, make sure we engage in justice after the, the past oppression, it's okay for us to confiscate property or whatever, right? But don't think that it's gonna be invariant with respect to people's behavior because the next generation is gonna sit there and say, okay, well, what's the expectation that property rights are secure? If they're not secure, I'm not gonna invest, right? I'll do something else. And if you believe that wealth is generated by long processes of production, it requires that those property rights be very secure going back very farther to pull the iron ore out of the ground, to be able to pass it down, to be able to build bridges or whatever. And if we shorten the time horizon of all of that, we can have street trading, but not wealth creation in terms of the, the long-term investments. I think that's an excellent point and something we need to keep on highlighting. The sort of progress we've made since 1994 is at the risk of being unraveled, especially around the, the amending around uh, of Section 25 of our Constitution. Um, my next question was around, again, tying into the pandemic and sort of real world examples, as it were, um, the idea of spontaneous order of people you know, interacting in ways that we can't always expect or predict or anything like that and how that infuriates central planners. So in your, um, in your work, you mentioned the toaster experiments. And of course, one we could also talk about is eye pencil, another famous one. So uh, Chris, maybe to you first, just the idea of spontaneous order, uh, what that tells us about human behavior um, and maybe a, some broader points about, I guess, how people interact with each other. Sure. Well, this is a, a big topic, but, but let me kind of try to motivate it and then discuss it a little bit. And so you mentioned a couple of things in there. So, of course, the, the most well-known or one of the most well-known pieces on this that you mentioned is, is Leonard Reed's Eye Pencil. Now, that was published in, in 1958. And people often forget the subtitle of that, which is important because it's My Family Tree. And so what is it getting at with My Family Tree? Well, if you took a, a basic number two lead pencil and then you went and unpacked that and said, well, this is the final consumer good that I'm holding, the output. Let me unpack all the different steps that went into that. You realize it's really complex, but somehow we get this pencil and it's uh, you know, 10 cents to, to purchase it. The toaster project that you mentioned is kind of a contemporary version of uh, iPencil, although it wasn't the point of the the, the inventor who actually carried out that project. It's, it's a book called The Toaster Project, but if, if viewers are interested, uh, Thomas Thwaites, who was the, the inventor that, that did this, he has a TED talk that, that summarizes in 10 minutes. And what he did is he went to a, uh, a, you know, a chain store and he purchased a very cheap toaster. Uh, he, he's in the UK, so I think it was three pounds for the toaster, plastic toaster, and he took it apart. And he finds that there's something like 400 and something parts that constitutes this basic toaster. And he said, you know what, I'm going to go around and, and try to recreate all these from scratch. And so he's down in the you know, iron ore mine chipping away and he's you know, doing the smelting and all that. And he, and he can't do it. He can't do it. It turns out to be this ugly plastic thing. It shorts out when he plugs it in. And this, of course, is after hours and days and weeks of effort. And he has nothing to show for it. And so what's the takeaway from that? Well, one takeaway is that you know, we take for granted that even the most basic items, a toaster that, that many people, when it, when it doesn't work anymore, we just get a new one. We say, ah, you know, it's, it's the, the inconvenience is actually having to go get a new one, not, not to go through the process of producing it. 
the pencil, these things we all take for granted. So that's kind of, 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 of one aspect of it that, that the, you know, the, the mundane things in life are, are really things of, of complexity, nuance, and beauty when you start thinking about it. But then the, the kind of really interesting questions get at what Pete was getting at earlier, which is how do you get all this stuff together? Like who put this together? No, no one, there's no toaster czar. There's no pencil czar that said, produce the pencil, produce the toaster and have it in that store at this point in time. Don't give people Yet it got it there. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris, what was that? Well, ideas for a pencil czar. You might give South African politicians a, a temptation. <laughs> <laughs> um, in any case, that's the beauty of spontaneous order, of coordination, of relying on markets to coordinate. So the idea of spontaneous order Menger talked about this. He called it emergent uh, uh, order or emergent institutions, but it's an idea that goes back to the to the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers. And so Adam Smith, Adam Ferguson, David Hume, all of these folks, there are others too, but you know, these folks really highlighted that a crucial part of human life was that a array of very complex mechanisms, not just economic, by the way but legal mechanisms, institutional mechanisms like property rights, norms, conventions, and so on, were not the result of any one, one person or small group of, of people's design, purposeful design, but emerged out of the interactions between individuals. So that's the idea behind spontaneous order. So Hayek pointed out that we any advanced civilization needs to rely on spontaneous order again, to what degree is, is an open question, but needs to rely on it to some degree because if we rely on human reason, even of the most high IQ, high intelligence people in society, our ability to do things is still severely limited just because any one human mind or group, small group of human minds is severely limited in what they can uh, understand and envision. And of course we live in an open-ended world so that we can't never hope to understand everything because things are constantly changing. And so that places parameters, places constraints on what we can hope to achieve, what we can hope to do. And that's okay. That is not a, a cynical position. It is not a pessimistic position. Rather, it is simply a position of understanding the world in which we live. But it's also, to my way of thinking, reason for optimism because it highlights that one of the, the really amazing features of human society is that we are able to think about institutional arrangements which unleash the power of human creativity, of discovery, of experimentation, of entrepreneurship, and to move beyond economics narrowly understood, human flourishing, because all of these institutional arrangements are bound up in allowing people being people. Again, think about going back to our discussion of subjectivism. You have some conjecture about combining scarce resources together because you think it will be good, that people will value it. And you tell me about it and you say, I have this business proposal. I, I, I think it's great. I say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That will never work. And then you say, well, I don't know. I think it will work. I'm going to test my conjecture, if you will, by actually carrying it out and seeing if it works or not. Now imagine if I was the czar who said, I'm in charge because <clears throat> I'm the expert. And I say, that's a silly plan, so you can't do it those type of experiments be ruled out ex ante because I, I'm in charge. So we let people, this is Hayek's idea behind the constitution of liberty, we let people have freedom because it allows them to experiment, to pursue those things they want to pursue, both in achieving their own individual well-being, but also because in doing so, it contributes to Advance, advances in broader human society and civilization. And so the, the idea of spontaneous order is all bound up in that, as well as several of the other concepts that we've been talking about together. This matters, and this is the final thing I'll say, for things like the response to a pandemic or to other things, because it, at a minimum, makes us aware that we are severely limited in what we can accomplish. That's the minimum. More broadly, it says, or, or again, makes clear that we can't accomplish many of the things we, we think we can accomplish, or we're gonna accomplish them quite poorly. The reason why is because efforts to impose a simple order, 
simple, not being simple minded, but simple that I can grasp it using human reason on a complex system leads to a disjoint. And so you can never constrain by definition all the points, parts of a, a complex system. And so you impose a simple ordering on a complex system, it's going to lead to an array of perverse consequences, many of which are going to undermine the very goals that the designer of the intervention purports to want to achieve. And so that's one of the many takeaways of sp the spontaneous order way of thinking. Pete, you want to jump in? Your mute's on. Uh, just to uh, follow up on Chris, which I think is just a fantastic explanation. My, one of my favorite chapters making these kind of points is in Hayek's Constitution of Liberty called The Creative Powers of a Free Civilization. Um, and uh, I highly recommend it to your readers. But I think there's also, a, a, you know, one, a, the one line kind of idea which comes from Adam Smith and all the way up to Hayek is that no mind or group of minds has the, the knowledge to be able to plan an economy, you know, root and branch. And that is the sort of alternative idea, this self-regulation of the market versus the regulation of an overseer, right? That, that's the, the kind of the, the two different visions. And I think it's important to realize that the Enlightenment project, this is again, too big for our little monograph, but it will explain a lot of the way in which free market ideas have been discussed in the last, say, decade or so if you just follow me for a second, which is that the Enlightenment project told us that progress was possible. Prior to the Enlightenment, we didn't believe progress was possible. And the dominant value systems were either going to be the old warrior virtues, right? So if you read, you know, Homer, you know, it's the warrior virtues that are emphasized. And then the alternative is the Christian virtues. Right. Uh, you know, and that's the alternative. And what we saw with the rise of the Enlightenment project, especially the Scottish Enlightenment, is an endorsing of the commercial virtues. So those commercial virtues, I say the Enlightenment in general, because, again, Voltaire, when Voltaire is talking about the civilizing aspects of commerce and the Jew, the Gentile and the Muslim, you know, warring outside. But when they meet in the market, you know, they, they cooperate with one another and the word infidel is only left for those who won't keep their promises, right? Kind of idea, won't, won't honor their contracts. That idea which Smith then embodied and then was developed um, becomes such an important part of why we had the great enrichment, why we had such tremendous increase in output um, in, the, in the economic growth over the 19th and into the 20th century. And it's those kind of what McCloskey calls bourgeois virtues, which have been under attack for so long. And now even the Enlightenment project is very much under attack. And so the Austrian school, just like the Scottish uh, moral philosophers, Smith and Hume, Ferguson, uh, the, the British you know, of utilitarians, you know, Mill and, and, and whatnot, the French, uh, political economist John Baptiste Say, and then the Austrian economists, they're all part of this broader notion of the Enlightenment project and understanding the nature of progress and the institutions that allow us to realize the gains from trade. Or another way to put it is, you know, what institutions allow us to engage in productive specialization and realize peaceful social cooperation through exchange? And that's what that's the, the the goose that lays the golden egg of wealth creation is the, the expansion of mutually beneficial exchanges and the ability to realize those and the institutions that justify that or or, you know, uh, give value to that as a moral system. Those are the ones that get ahead and the ones, so why some countries are rich and other countries are poor? You look at the institutions and the institutions are derivative from value systems. So this is the interaction between culture and, uh, and institutions and then economic performance. And I think that that question, if, if, if a student or a person was reading our, our introduction, got through it and then started following up on the readings, 
and then thought about this big question, why are some countries rich and other countries poor, which in the essence was Adam Smith's question, and it's our question today, right? Uh, you know, the most famous books in political economy at the moment are asking that same question. So, you know, Doran, uh, you know, Asimoglu and James Robinson's Why Nations Fail, or their more recent book, The Narrow Corridor Towards Liberty, uh, you know, these, these are all asking these fundamental questions that we've been asking for centuries now, and we're just, you know, giving the scientific principles that help us engage in that conversation. And spontaneous order is one of the most crucial elements of that, that, that I guess I had to, I forgot what my main point was, <laughs> but spontaneous order is, is a crucial concept in that, in that uh, conversation. I think something that a lot of people lose sight of a lot of the time is the sort of focus on wealth inequality, but none of us ask the, none of us realize that the natural state of things is poverty and what conditions are necessary for prosperity and growth and that kind of thing. And what do countries need to put in place if you want the government to be doing something? I mean, I don't want to say that as a libertarian, but at least I want them to put in place strong property rights and that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. Um, McCloskey used, uh, uh, used to give a presentation where she would walk across the stage showing the history of human growth. And she would go like, Ooh, whoop. and you know, and that's all the sudden. And so our attention is drawn to where it is that that all of a sudden it just goes whoop like this. And so that's fascinated us and done that. But that makes your point that the natural condition of humanity for most of the history of mankind has been one of misery and poverty and oppression and the opening up of the ability to overcome that, to be emancipated, right? That project, that emancipation project draws our attention to certain things. And I think that's crucial because we can say that people, people can live in many different types of ways, but the number of ways that people can live together that produces peace and prosperity is a small subset of that. And unfortunately, if we go certain ways because we just take it for granted, we actually end up by invoking more violence, marking more oppression. That's the sad tragedy. And so this is the notion of the, uh, like in the road to serfdom, that isn't a story, a moral tale of the bastards getting control and they do bastardly things. It's a tragic story right? The highest ideals, the most, you know, well-intended people, and you end up by creating, uh, you know, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. And, and what Chris was mentioning before, spontaneous order, those become the two economic ways of seeing the world in many ways, which is that the pursuit of interest, self-interest, can generate into a public good, depending on the institutional environment within which it operates, or the pursuit of altruistic and, and other regarding goals can produce a tragedy within another set of institutions. Those two juxtaposed positions demand our explanation. Saying that good people do good things or bad people do bad things doesn't require an explanation, right? It, you know, just stay away from the bad people, right? <laughs> yeah, only let the good people do it. And I think our intellectual conversations are so drawn to the good people, good things, bad people, bad things, that we miss out the real need for explanation, which is in that diagonal that Chris was talking about spontaneous order and I was talking about the road to serfdom kind of idea, those two ideas. So hopefully the book points people to study further these ideas so that they can make sense of the world around them. I could... Uh continue talking to you and listening to both of you i think for three hours um but i won't i won't won't want to take up uh, all of your day so as a sort of final note and again this might be an unfair one so you can dodge it or throw it off to the other person i guess if you want to but the prospects for for the enlightenment project for the understanding and implementation of the principles of austrian economics I guess for the next decade, do you see signs of hope here and there? Are you going to tell me that we're all doomed and we're heading downhill? That kind of thing. I mean, that's fine as well. We're not, we're not going to avoid the, the whole facts care about your feelings kind of narrative. So 
yeah, like I know that's a broad point, but I guess your projections for the next few years for, I guess, world, um, world prospects, as it were. Chris actually edited a volume on the future. So I will, I will defer to Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pete, for setting me up like that. I appreciate that. Done with um, I, 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 will, I will refrain from, from making any predictions about the future just because I don't know. I, I will say this. For the prospects of Austrian economics, I, I'm quite optimistic. And, I, I, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm close to this. So you might say it's in my interest to say that. But here's why I think it's – let me give you some, some concrete reasons. Number one, as Pete was saying, in academics proper, in economics proper, the ideas of Austrian economics, even if they don't, even if people never even heard of Austrian economics or they, they could care less about Austrian economics, you know, the, the elements that we've been talking about, they, they are still on, on the, the radar and, and at the table for ideas being discussed. As Pete was talking about, especially in things like economic development, you see this. The notion of entrepreneurship, even though it's missing from much of economics still, it's more, more in, in, in appreciated by economists than it has been certainly in decades past. You start mixing in issues of political economy, which of course, as Pete was saying, many uh, 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 economists uh, uh, um, neglected for long periods of time because they, 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 they kind of did their analysis in an institutional vacuum. That's widely accepted now. Pete was talking about the role of this in the context of the road to serfdom and other type issues, but those things matter now. And so there's room at the table for Austrian economists to have a say, both in economics, but also in political science and public policy and so on. Number two is simply that the work that is being done, and, 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 and I'll highlight some of our own programs at George Mason, as you mentioned in our introduction, Pete and I work together in, in the F.A. Hayek program for the advanced study in philosophy, politics, and economics. It's Pete's vision, really, a vision that he, that he had decades ago. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to work with him in that initiative, along with our co colleague Virgil Store and others. But we train graduate students and, and teach students at George Mason, but we also have a whole host of programs that are outward facing, that, that, that where we interact with students who are pursuing their graduate work at both the master's and PhD levels across disciplines. We, not just economists, political scientists, anthropologists, uh, uh, archaeologists, all, all these different fields, you know, history, education. And we sit around the table and have deep intellectual engagements with them about foundational and advanced readings in Austrian economics, in political economy, and so on. There's no goal in that other than having a conversation about these ideas and exposing people to these ideas, not in necessarily to convince them, but to have an intellectual conversation about how these ideas fit into both a historical context, but also a contemporary context. And so from that standpoint, I think there, there's reason for optimism. What's the reason for pessimism? Well, look, it's one that's not new to today. It's one that's existed throughout uh, human history and certainly one since we've had institutions uh, that uh, allowed space for human freedom. Uh, and what is that? Well, it's one that, that Hayek pointed out in, in his uh, uh, one, one of the volumes of Law, Legislation, and Liberty. I think it's the third volume, but I could be misremembering this. But she says, look, the hardest challenge for a free society is that we can't promise you concrete things. Go back to our discussion about spontaneous order. The, you know, if someone said, well, well, Chris, you know, you said spontaneous order is great. Tell me what it's going to give me. I would say, I don't know. That's precisely why we want freedom. That's why we want spontaneous order. If I knew those things, they'd exist already. But Hayek says, look, here's the challenge. Planners can always promise you concrete stuff. If you give me power over economic life, I can give you X amount of income. I can give you health care. I can give you whatever you want. If you give up some of your freedoms, I can give you security. I can promise you concrete outcomes. And that's a really tough thing to push against, as Hayek points out, to push back against, which is to say, on the one hand, you have someone promising concrete outcomes. On the other hand, you have someone saying, I don't know what it will produce, but I know it will produce things that make people better off over time. And the task then for those of us who subscribe to the vision laid out by Hayek and by many others 
regarding liberalism, liberalism in the traditional sense, is to make the case for that, to make clear to people why that's important. And that's the multi-pronged attack. On the one hand, we have to constantly reiterate many of the principles we've been talking about here. But on the other hand, to, to or, or another prong of this, to kind of borrow a line from James Buchanan is we need to ignite the soul of classical liberalism in people. Buchanan's point is that, look, you are not going to excite people by talking to them about the finer points of the capital structure of production and economic calculation. Some people get excited by that, but it's, it's a small number. What you need to do in, in Buchanan's telling at least is to excite people about the opportunities presented by liberalism, not just for advancements in economic well-being, which are quite important, but for human flourishing broadly understood, for things like toleration, for things like uh, a re deep respect for your fellow human beings, human dignity, human rights, and so on. And of course, all these things are bundled together, but they're crucial to the liberal project broadly understood. And so that's the, that's the challenge. But again, that's not to my way of thinking a new challenge. It's always been the challenge. And so if to go back to your opening question, is the, it, what's gonna happen in the future? It depends. It depends on, on, on how that evolves. Uh, on, and an array of other things, of course, how they evolve. But we know at, their core, at, at its core, what is required for human well-being and flourishing, as Pete put it, it's, it's a matter of how those things are going to manifest or not manifest themselves in reality. And so I don't know if Pete has anything to, to add beyond that. No, I think that's a fantastic summary of where we're at in the, in the mission of not only doing the science of economics, but for those of us who want to be actively engaged with our fellow citizens, which is a different job, okay, um, uh, than doing scientific economics, but that is to ignite the soul of classical liberalism again, because I think that that's what's really necessary for us to uh, ensure the, the, you know, value going forward, the future, and all of that. This is one of the reasons why I think McCloskey's work is so important um, on the bourgeois virtues and bourgeois dignity. And I think that we need more voices like that uh, in the world today. I think that's a perfectly apt, uh, realistic, challenging and motivational note on which to end. I couldn't think of, of any better point. Um, so professors, again, I want to thank you for your time and your insights today. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, viewers and listeners, I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it informative. Please rem remember to like the video. Please share it on your different social media platforms, wherever you, where you are now, whether it's on Telegram, Signal, WhatsApp, Facebook, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, share it all over the place. We very much appreciate your support. Uh, we'll have one more episode this week. I'll be talking to uh, the CEO of FinFind about their report last year about um, small businesses in South Africa and how many businesses had to close down because of the lockdown. Um, but until then, uh, take care for the next few days and we'll talk to you again very soon. Bye-bye.